from the world's most incredible engineering feats. Our biggest problem is we cannot build this fast enough. To the world's fastest camels. They are one of the smartest animals in the world. This is Mega World Dubai. Kevin Brosh, welcome to Mega World Dubai. Now, it may not look like it right now, but believe me, this is one of the busiest places on the entire planet. As you can see over my shoulder, up to 40% of the world's cranes are working here in Dubai right now. Believe me, the construction, it never stops, not even at night. And right now, I'm standing on one of the modern wonders of the world. The Palm Islands are the largest artificial islands ever created. And how they were built is absolutely incredible. This is mega engineering at its finest. And in Dubai, this, the Palm Islands, are just the tip of the iceberg. It's a place where big, bigger, biggest takes on a whole new meaning. Dubai is just pulsing with energy. There's non-stop building. It's a playground for the rich. It offers up the biggest and the best. From the world's tallest building to the first indoor ski hill. And there's no signs of slowing down. Our biggest problem is we cannot build this fast enough. Today, their contractors are so busy that our biggest challenge is how fast we can deliver. 80,000 apartments, condos, and villas have been built in the last five years, fueling Dubai's remarkable transformation from a sleepy desert outpost to a world economic powerhouse. Dubai is one of seven sovereign sheikdoms in the Persian Gulf that make up the United Arab Emirates, and each emirate is ruled by its own monarch. And Sheikh Mohammed says, don't give me something that I'm going to get it in 20 years. I want to see something in the next five years, something I can see with my own eyes. So I want something for the people now. Unlike its Gulf neighbors, Dubai has little oil, succeeding instead on ingenuity. Maybe it was a blessing, because if we had oil, we would have not worked as hard. But we really work day and night to be able to grow. And parts of Dubai have literally grown from the sea. The Palm Islands were a vision that solved two problems, creating a stretch of magnificent beachfront and thousands of upscale properties. It's not like we decided palm looks nice, you know, a banana looks nice also, and an apple looks nice, you know, but they don't give you 70 kilometers. A shape of a palm did give us. The first island was named Palm Jumeirah. It was soon followed by a bigger island, Palm Jebel Ali. Island number three, Palm Dera, is still under construction. Actually, we have created in the last six years 800 kilometers of beachfront for Dubai and of course we have another 700 to go by the time we finish the third part which is the biggest staggering but not surprising here in Dubai everything is done on a massive scale before all of this was water none of the sand you see here was it was around six to ten meters deep seabed so how do you transform the Arabian Sea into multi-million dollar beachfront? Well, by bringing together big thinkers and heavy-duty dredgers. Gargantuous. From dredging point of view, this is like heaven. We have projects all over the world, but they, they just have so much going on here, here in Dubai. And, and this Gulf region is just... One man started making a palm island, now they all want to. This job calls for a fleet of dredgers. We take the material that you see here that's, that's built the islands, we take it from about 20 nautical miles offshore. We use various types of uh, dredging craft to pick it up off the seabed. We take about a metre and a half, maybe five feet of sediment from the sea floor per sweep. Depositing mountains of sand every day. Meanwhile, cutter dredgers carve out the channels inside the palm, drilling through 13 meters of solid rock. This is the cutter. This is a six-arm cutter. We have all kinds of types depending on the ground which are, you are cutting. But this is quite call our rock cutter because the top layer here is quite rocky. 
trick is creating a nice smooth channel. These monster molars last eight to 10 hours before they need changing. The cut rock is then pumped through a pipeline to the spray pontoon. And as that pile of sediment gets higher and higher, we use a technique called rain bombing, which actually fires a slurry of material and water onto that landmass so then it can rise up out of the water. The operator follows the pattern on his GPS. Once it's done, 10 meters of sand is added. Vibrating steel rods are then inserted into the sand, creating solid ground. They are now racing to finish the trunk of the Palm Jebel Ali, including 14 kilometers of key structural walls. Sheikh Mohammed insisted on using only organic building materials in the sea. So they're using rocks instead of concrete. The rock you see uh, behind me is coming uh, from the mountains uh, 750, 200 kilometers away. We get here a daily uh, supply of some 40,000 ton every day. That's some uh, 800 trucks and lorries that drive day and night. This one and a half billion dollar project created spectacular beachfront living for people like Andrew Martin Dukes. We're uh, here, here on Palm Jumeirah. Um, welcome to my home. I'd always wanted to live by the sea. Uh, I'd seen the project uh, when it was released, uh, and I said if I could ever afford uh, to buy uh, one of these, uh, I would do that. Dukes moved here from the UK in 2005 to avoid paying taxes. He recently sold his electronic greeting card company for millions. Today, he's very happily retired. Fantastic, it's fabulous. You know, coming out to this every day, um, straight down the steps, onto your own beach, into the water. Yeah, very, very nice. Uh, three years ago, none of this was here. Uh, the, the skyline that you see behind me did not exist. Only two of those buildings uh, were here three years ago. So, you know, the, the, the way in which Dubai develops, the speed, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it is just amazing. But all of this building will mean even more traffic on Dubai's already overcrowded roads. So a 70-kilometer light rail line is being rushed to completion. They're also building a 1.7-kilometer bridge over Dubai Creek. At just over 200 meters high, it will be the world's tallest arch bridge. I think that's going to make a huge impact in the future of real estate development in Dubai. And the bridge, to some extent, will contribute in that it will allow people for the first time to commute without being in their cars. That's because in addition to six car lanes in either direction, the sixth crossing bridge will integrate with the rail system and house a train station that will connect to a future opera house. Part of the never-ending growth here in Dubai. From the construction race to racing of a different sort, I'm talking about camel racing. Yes, it's an ancient sport with a decidedly modern twist. Robotic jockeys. It's coming up next on Mega World Dubai. All right, welcome back to Mega World Dubai. Hi, I'm Kevin Brush. <laughs> Here with my good camel friend, this is Sarif. You know, seriously, these animals are highly popular here in the Emirates where they even host camel beauty pageants. It's true. Sarif won Mr. Congeniality not too long ago. And in fact, one of the region shakes, well, he reportedly paid $7 million for a pair of purebred racing camels not long ago. Camel racing has unparalleled popularity here in the Emirates, and we are about to take you behind the scenes and show you all the madness that goes on at a camel racetrack. Whoa, let's ride. <laughs> Woo. There's something truly magical about a desert sunrise. It's almost like a scene out of the Bible. Now fast forward several thousand years. Add some live TV, a few high-tech jockeys, and you have the Middle East Sport of Kings. It's one of the hottest tickets in the United Arab Emirates. If I can see number one, if there is a number before number one, so this is the, the camel racing. 
And Abdul Rahman Amin would know. He's the premier track announcer in Dubai. And today is a big day for camel racing aficionados. It's day one of the Camel Race Festival. It's a very, very, very good and sporty day that we could start the camel racing. I think you can see there is a lot of uh, people or participants over here. These are the top rookie racers in the Middle East. Camels and handlers gather in the pre-race area, waiting to check in and get their number. Then it's off to the starting line, where avoiding the stampede is a sport in itself. These guys don't get hurt because they know how to protect themselves. The race is five kilometers long. And the camels can reach a top speed of around 40 kilometers an hour. It's a lot easier promoting a sport that no longer uses four-year-old children as jockeys, replacing them with aluminum and plastic robots that still look human. That's so the camels won't get spooked. Their handlers drive alongside shouting instructions to their camel. The directions are amplified through a soundboard inside the jockey. A joystick and buttons brandish the whip and control the reins. By the way, the camel knows my voice between the, somebody else's voice. They are more than smart, one of the smartest animals in the world. Sometimes the four-legged race on the track is not as entertaining as the four-wheel action on the road. There are no favorites today. That's because young camels are kind of unpredictable. Some are good starters. Others are better sprinters or strong finishers. These handlers watch their camel take an early lead. The tension starts to set in as it falls behind. One handler actually resorts to yelling out his window. Looks like he and the camel have not quite bonded yet. We love the camels as the camels loves us. He knows me and I know him. If I have 10 camels, there is one or two which is more loved to me. Similar to when you have children. There is one of your children whom you like him more than others. It doesn't mean that you don't like your other children. But no, I like him more. The Crown Prince of Dubai is a big fan. He also owns one of the camels in today's race. It's uh, our tradition uh, here in Dubai, and uh, it's growing uh, pretty much quick. And uh, our uh, our people loves uh, racing with camels. Betting is not allowed in Muslim countries, but there are plenty of prizes. With the champion camel taking home thirty thousand dollars, others may be looking for another line of work. Let's get the inside scoop on the popular post-game show, Camel Studio, where Abdul Rahman Amin and his panel of experts break down the day's races. Mr. Suhail Ghurab and Mr. Ahmed Khalfan and Mr. Salim Saeed, they are the Arabian experts in the in the camel racing. We can talk about the first uh, race and who won the first race, who got the best time in the morning. And today's big winner was the Crown Prince's camel, Nasaba, crossing the finish line in a very respectable seven minutes, 35.7 seconds. It is excellent time and we are expecting better than that one also. Stay tuned. After such an exciting first day, it's no wonder some think that camel racing could be the next big thing. I, th I think he likes me. Up next on Mega World Training for Extreme Circumstances, Dubai style. When we come back, it's one-on-one -on -one with the Dubai Police Force. It's true. Hey, welcome back to Mega World Dubai. I'm Kevin Brosh.
Very proudly, Dubai is one of the safest destinations in the entire Middle East. Biggest problem around here seems to be with all the traffic and too many serious car accidents. The remedy? Well, Dubai has created one of the most modern emergency response teams in the entire region. That, along with some very impressive high-tech security systems, means the Dubai police force can do their job efficiently and quietly behind the scenes. We got some unprecedented access to see what goes into serving and protecting the people of Dubai. <laughs> is a staged scenario involving the elite protective security and emergency departments of the Dubai police. Riot police are training to deal with angry demonstrators, protesting the visit of a high-profile diplomat. This exercise is as close as it gets to real combat. A fully integrated response requires instantaneous actions, like laying down a row of barbed wire to clear a path for the convoy, but also being prepared for further attack. This uh, gentleman is passing with a, with a protective security of uh, our team. Reacting to roadside bombs are an integral part of this exercise. So we try to take him back. Unfortunately, there is another car for these people came to block the road in front of him. A tightly choreographed sequence of events has to unfold. Police must pin down the gunmen so the VIP can be rushed from harm's way, even if it means having to track them down later. This unit is also trained to deal with potential booby-trapped cars. And that's where the Mach 8 Bravo robot comes in. We use it always, uh, you know, for suspect cars. And instead of put your man in danger, you can uh, take this wheelbarrow to check any item. Outfitted with a camera and an arsenal of powerful weapons, the Mach 8 Bravo is operated remotely from a nearby truck. With this one, we can break a window, the car window, so the tilt tube can go inside with the camera check inside. And if there is any suspect bag inside, we can shoot it with the pick stick. And this, the big one, is we use it all the time for the trunk. After blowing the trunk open, the robot goes in for a closer look. Once the coast is clear, a bomb tech makes his way to the car for a thorough inspection. Meanwhile, another elite unit prepares to storm the building. Timing is the key. This maneuver has to be done as quickly as possible. Across the street, commandos are practicing a dangerous hostage rescue. Dubai's elite units undergo intense training, working with the world's top protective and emergency response teams. This VIP protection unit was recently created to guard visiting female heads of state. When real events do occur, they are monitored out of the Dubai Command and Control Center one of the most sophisticated tracking systems in the world. We receive information through our telephone uh, lines, the 999, which is the emergency number. We receive other calls going to the duty officer. And of course, from our uh, cameras on the roads and the important locations. This state-of-the-art screen provides real-time images from 1,200 cameras around Dubai. These cameras are at major locations in the streets. They are connected also to the shopping centers. And we are connected to the Gold Soup, for example. It's one of the uh, very critical uh, locations in Dubai, very important. And you can see the camera, how clear it is. Experts in body language look for suspicious activity immediately dispatching help if necessary. Previously, we could only see our petrol cars, but in the current uh, command and control center, we see our cars, we see the motorbikes, we see our boats, we see our ambulance cars, we see our rescue cars, and we can even see our 
helicopter and foot patrol. Patrol cars are equipped with onboard computers. Every building in Dubai can be displayed in 3D, allowing for better planning in the event of an incident. Dubai holds the dubious title of worst traffic in the Middle East. An accident takes place every three minutes. That keeps its emergency response teams busy. In this stage scenario, two men are crushed under a construction vehicle. Police, ambulance, rescue and air ambulances are called to the scene. In the type of accident, uh, we, our, our uh, mission is uh, like to save the people. Rescuers must learn to master a wide variety of tools that can save precious time by quickly prying accident victims from wreckage. Knowing that in this type of situation, every second counts. Up. We have like a standards for responding for all our patrols. We have 15 minutes from the call for accident. We need to be in the scene before the 15 minutes. And at the same time, we need to very fast take the uh, patient to the hospital. Rescue teams also respond to industrial accidents daily. One of the most common involves window washers losing control of their platform after getting electrocuted. That means getting to the roof right away. First thing is safety. You have to be sure because you don't want to be the other victim. Meticulous preparation reduces potential problems. You see, when we come down, there is a two line. You know, in case one is caught or anything happen, we have another one, like a safety line. Now comes the tricky part. Hooking up the victim and getting him to the ground. Paramedics then work on getting the victim stabilized. So they can get him into the ambulance and off to the hospital. Practice makes perfect for all of Dubai's elite units. Never a dull moment for these guys and some really sweet squad cars too. And from the hustle and the bustle of the city to the Arabian Sea's exotic marine life, coming up next on Mega World, it's a brand new luxury hotel here in Dubai with the world's largest outdoor aquarium. Hey, welcome back to Mega World Dubai. Such an amazing place. Now, it's a phrase you hear often, but believe me when I say that this, well, this really is the next big thing here in Dubai. And back on the Palm Islands at the brand new Atlantis complex where they're just putting the finishing touches on this remarkable hotel and aquarium. Now, this aquarium is just chock full of some of the most exotic sea life you will ever encounter. And guess what? It's all local. Dubai is known for its palatial hotels and resorts, but Atlantis may top them all. This is probably the prime lot on the crescent of Palm Jumeirah. It's got views inland and views out to the sea. We've got the monorail right above us here. The monorail will be delivering a lot of guests to the hotel, a lot of day visitors to the water park and the aquarium. And they are in for quite the thrill. A unique showcase of the spectacular sea life that lives in the Arabian Sea. From the surface, it looks like it could just be a water feature in a hotel, but in actual fact, you've got 3 million gallons, 11 million liters of seawater right here, 75 meters long, 30 meters across, 10 meters deep, living marine environment. You know, we're going to have uh, 60,000 animals in here. It takes a great deal of planning to get the right mix. So far, the tank has been stocked with 8,500 creatures, representing 40 different species. There's 180-odd species of fish uh, documented locally in these waters, and we're trying to get as many as possible. It's all about creating the balance and the harmony within the exhibit. There's a living environment, it's got to be uh, kept perfect, and we've got to balance out the predators and the prey 
to make sure that all of these animals are comfortable in their, their surroundings. Most are brought in by local fishermen. They are first placed in small tanks and checked for illnesses or injuries. We've got a lot of fish to put in that tank. It's a big tank we've got to fill. Uh, it keeps us very busy. We're moving a lot of fish. To make the moving easier, the water level is lowered and the fish are administered a mild anesthetic. It just knocks them out a little bit. Because there's a range of fish in here, we'll see some fish literally look like they're almost dead. They're just having a nice little snooze. We don't damage them any further while we're chasing them around and putting them in tubs. By the time they reach the ambassador, they're waking up and away they go and have a happy, healthy life in the ambassador tank. It's just a short trip to the tank that these fellows will now call home. releasing the fish into the shallower end of the, the Ambassador Lagoon so that for that first few seconds in their new home, they don't get beat up by anything that's in there. First 30 seconds in a new environment can all be a little bit stressful sometimes. Once they've acclimatized, these sea creatures can count on top drawer service. They're fed the same five-star foods as the hotel guests. Okay, I'm cutting about 10 kilos of small cuts of squids. And for the whole day, for the morning and afternoon feed, we do about 33 kilos of squids. After the squid, I do the anchovies. And then the shrimps as well. Make sure the fish in the dam are feeding properly. <laughs> they really love this one, squeeze. The trick is keeping the animals healthy. No easy feat when you're surrounded by construction. Every day is a challenge right now until we open and the construction is finished. There's bits of polystyrene falling into the water, there's dust. But the great thing is we have a wonderful team here. Keeping the water clean is a top priority. It's brought in from the ocean, pre-treated, and then sent off to the huge filtration area, which processes 11 million liters in just 70 minutes. It gets treated in there again for a second time before it actually gets into this area. So it's already gone through two passes, and that's why you do have the, the, the clarity that you've got and the, the perfect chemistry. Um, the, the salinity is the same as the ocean, the, the temperature is maintained. There's never a dull moment as they get closer to their grand opening. You could be coming in one day and you have to clean the acrylic to make sure that you, know, you can see through and there's no algae growth. You could come in the next day, you have to turn over the sand. You kind of come in the next day, you're going to feed the fish by hand, get to know the animals, learn about them look at their body and are they healthy, are they looking good? And then the next day you get to move large um, artifacts around in the tank and put them into position. Atlantis will provide a great opportunity for people to view the incredible variety of marine life that they would normally never see. Nice stuff. Now, the Atlantis Aquarium isn't the only place importing goods around here. In fact, Dubai is known as the consumer capital of the entire Middle East. Everything from gold to cars, it seems the demand here is never ending. That's up next on Mega World. All right, welcome back to Mega World Dubai. I'm Kevin Brosh. You know, if there was a sign at the entrance to this bustling city, it would probably read something like, Welcome to Dubai, open for business. Seriously, this place is known around the globe as a key center of commerce. Ironically, though, nothing actually originates from this place. But having said that, Dubai really has turned itself into an indispensable way station for imports and exports. Check it out. This creek has been the lifeblood of Dubai for hundreds of years. We are traders, we are merchants. Somebody buys something from us, we sell something to them, and they sell something to us, and, and, and this created a relation. 
whether it's with Iran or whether it's with the neighbors or with India, with Africa. Building an economic powerhouse in spite of the geography, the climate, and the lack of natural resources. In the desert, you cannot grow anything. You have very little water, and the people of this part of the world are also very tough people. No matter how tough things look to people, to us, not tough. We've been through wars. Old-fashioned wooden dows are still supplying goods to the markets from other countries. If you go to the old souk of Dubai, you go to a shop, that's such a small shop, and you say, what is he selling? This is cardamom good for coffee, for tea. Number one, Iranian. Number two, Afghanistan. Number three, India. And you see all these big bags and piles of, of, of all kinds of goods. And I have mixed curry powder, saffron, ginger, cumin, aniseed, black pepper, everything inside. Good for cooking, for chicken, for everything. Oh, my God, very nice. But you don't realize that that same shop has a warehouse somewhere with goods worth $40 million. This family business imports 15,000 tons of products a year from around the world. Their warehouse is filled to the ceiling, and to keep pace with the times, a new facility has just been constructed, pushing Dubai's centuries-old nuts and spice business into the 21st century. The modern warehouse will be able to accommodate three times the volume, allow for a quick turnover of goods, and most importantly, it will house giant containers. While goods still arrive on wooden dows, the majority now come on massive container ships. Dubai's Jebel Ali port is one of the most technologically advanced in the world, establishing Dubai as a major trading hub. It's the biggest facility uh, in terms of a single container terminal in the world, and we are doing huge volumes, big volume, mega volumes really. We are doing a volume twice what India does in a year. 11 million containers came through in 2007, up more than 2 million from the previous year. Now, unlike other ports, massive cranes can lift up to four containers at a time, cutting loading and unloading time by 50%. Utilizing the latest information technology, Dubai is about to become the world's most futuristic port. In order to speed up uh, the trade or the boxes, the containers, what we are implementing now, we are implementing a portal where uh, a trader who can sit at home, his office, in front of his uh, computer, and basically clear his goods by having uh, his document cleared through e-clearance. He can pay his dues through e-payments. And then we are linked with customs, we are linked with uh, other authorities which need to clear all what requires through e-clearance. There is an incredible demand for goods, especially new cars. You know that in this place, we are selling around 1,000 cars a month. And this is just one of nine Nissan car dealerships in Dubai. It's the same right across the board, with many homes owning up to four cars. In a market like this, we have every year about 285,000 cars coming here. And in a market of 4 million people, this is considered as one of the largest rates in the world. 25% of those cars are re-exported. The rest stay here. Demand is so great, they're predicting double-digit growth for the next several years. And it's not just car dealers that are cashing in. One of the oldest and most valuable commodities is also benefiting from Dubai's emergence as the world's leading destination for high-end goods. Global demand for gold has never been higher, and Dubai has established itself alongside Switzerland as a major player, importing around 500 tons of the precious metal each year. Most of it ends up in the famous gold souk, or fancy shopping malls across the city. Gold has its own allure because it's more shiny, it's more dazzling, it is more malleable. Uh, it is one of those very few metals where you can uh, shape it into anything you like. People have made armors out of it, people make small rings, people have made crowns, so I think so the yellow color is very uh, soothing to the eye and to the heart, I believe. Most gold arrives in bars and is made into jewelry locally. This is the size of the gold bar which we start with. First it is taken and then put it into a machine. The gold bar is run through the machine many times until it becomes a thinner plate. It's so soft that you can just literally break it with your hands after it's been cut. You take these pieces, then put them into a scale, 
It is then weighed and mixed with alloys to give it strength and shine. For example, here you see it's a pink colored um, pure copper. When we mix this with uh, yellow gold, only yellow gold and this, it will give the gold a pinkish tinge. It will show gold to be pink. The alloy which is there right now, it will give us this white color. Jewelry making is equal parts art and science, combining creativity with acids, chemicals, and metals. All of the ingredients are heated until they reach a liquid form, and then they are poured into a white gold metal bar. 18 karat gold is now ready to be made into jewelry. A process that has not changed much over the years. Highly skilled craftsmen grind, smooth, and polish the gold into the final product. An ancient process that is more popular than ever, drawing people here from around the globe. As the world shrinks, business in Dubai continues to grow. Okay, when we come back, we're off to the races again, this time for a very different type of event. It's a sport that's just catching on here in Dubai. It's drag racing. That's up next. Hey there, welcome back to Mega World. I'm Kevin Brosh. Now, it's safe to say that people here in Dubai love their cars and they like to drive them really fast. So much so it actually became a problem not too long ago with young people racing through the streets at incredibly fast speeds. Well, guess what? A member of the royal family came up with a solution. Build a drag racing track, bring in world-class instructors to teach people how to burn rubber in a safe environment. Well, it is quickly becoming a very popular sport here. It's qualifying day at the Emirates Motorplex. Drag racing enthusiasts are looking to make their mark. We got a new motor in the car. It's a Pro Mod. Uh, it's a V8 big block, 870 cubic inches. Operate on nitrous. Steve Casas has come over from the United States to help get the sport going. And he likes what he sees. It's awesome. It's, uh, it's growing. These guys ain't afraid to uh, spend the money and buy the equipment, and uh, it's, it's going to get bigger and bigger every year, I believe. It's an expensive sport. A good car costs $300,000, not including parts. Yeah, we just paid $90,000 for this motor from Fulton uh, Motorsports in the United States. The winner will take home around $5,000, a tiny fraction of what it takes to maintain these cars. But they're not here for the cash, they're in it for the glory. These guys are locals. I can very proud of these guys. This is Abdullah and Ali. They are calibrating the clutch of this car by themselves. And they used to hire a guy coming all the way from America to calibrate this clutch. <laughs> Obeid Al Gawi runs the Emirates Motorplex, taking the best from the West and adding some local flavor, like the traditional Dubai greeting. This team caught the attention of a local crown prince. He liked their car so much, he bought it. Now he's their sponsor. Badr Ali is a co-owner and the team's main driver. Badr uh, is one of the oldest people who came and raced here in this track. Yes, he started small, but now he owns the best cars uh, in the Middle East. Badr's 2007 Mustang boasts a 3,500 horsepower blower engine that runs on pure methanol, increasing the thermal efficiency and power output compared to gasoline. I need at least a month or you can say at least 10 races more to have a good experience how to, to deal with this engine. This beast does a ridiculous 390 kilometers an hour, flat out. The tires last only 16 races. The incredible amount of heat generated causes oil to leak out of the tires. I wish and uh, I'm making my, uh, my the best to be number one qualifying. The man on the left, Khalid Al-Balushi, is the reigning champion for the last two years. And this year, he's the leading point getter. He's got two cars in today's races. But all good, so it's gonna be a good race. They're all good. This place to be. 
only place to be. This is one of only three drag racing tracks in the entire Middle East. Desert conditions make driving on it different from Western tracks. Sand and wind affect the composition of the track, making it slippery and unstable. Drivers and their technicians have to learn to accommodate these conditions. There are several categories of cars racing today. It's the equivalent of the 100 meter sprint for cars. Fastest time wins. The top cars in each category will advance to tomorrow's final. The smaller cars take the track first. By early evening, it's time for the feature attractions. The first day of racing goes as predicted. Khalid is pleased with his two cars. The track was bad for the last couple of days, but today is good, so we'll see what happens. It was happy. Yeah. Yeah. So far, so good. Uh, we qualified first today. Batter is not entirely pleased, despite posting the second best time. Before the finish line, I left my, my leg on the accelerator because the track a little bit is not good. And uh, I believe for next run, I will, uh, I will make better than this number, I hope so. An onboard computer records different facets of the car's performance, like the engine, the drive shaft, and clutch. Drivers pour over the post-race data to improve for the next run. The drive shaft is not smooth, you know? It's, uh, it's up and down, up and down. This graph has to be very smooth. It means I have to reduce the power here. One of the top drag racers in the U.S., Shannon Iceman Jenkins, has been brought over to help train the drivers and make sure they have the right equipment. Oh, they love their cars dearly. I mean, it's going to be a great sport. They're learning constantly. I watch and talk to the guys, and of course, we try to help as much as we possibly can. What's the most important thing to learn? When to say no. When not to overdrive a car, especially if a ProMod style car like we have. It's tire shake, those type of things. The car is out of shape or it's getting out of the groove. You got to know when to lift. If you don't, well, the rest of it's pretty obvious. It'll, it'll get in the wall pretty quick. Batter has done his homework and is confident going into day two. I fixed the problem, uh, what, ha what happened with me yesterday, and I hope today I will uh, make good number. Meanwhile, Taki Sadiq has been busy tweaking his car for the big race. Everyone knows it's going to be tough keeping up with Batter's more powerful blower car, but speed isn't everything. So it's not how much power you get, it's, it's how you get that power to work on the track. You know, you have to compromise some sometimes, and you have to add sometimes. Today's race is drawing a lot of attention. Sheikh Mohammed from the Emirate of Um El Quain makes a grand entrance, taking a tour of the grounds. I can see there is uh, lots of uh, big cars like this one, a fast car. I was amazed that uh, this car has 2,000 horsepower on it, and the engine is uh, more than my helicopter. <laughs> A large crowd starts to gather in the bleachers for the three rounds of racing today. That was an excellent one, sir. Defending champion and favorite Khalid is up first. He blows away the competition early on. Meanwhile, Batter's Mustang is too powerful for Taki Sadiq. In the semis, Batter loses control halfway down the track. It's believed he's got tire shake, but didn't take his foot off the accelerator, still hoping to win the race. A shaken Batter emerges from the car. It looks like the Mustang took the brunt of the impact he's able to make it to the ambulance under his own power. They just took him to the hospital to make sure that he's fine, and that's it. He's a bit angry. I, I, I mean, I would be the same because, because, you know, he wanted to win, because he wanted to be on the final, that's it. But everything is fine. After a quick cleanup, it's time for the finals. Khalid is taking on a driver from Bahrain. It's a close race, but Khalid retains the championship. Time to celebrate not only the victory, but the sport's bright future here in Dubai. My friends, we've reached the finish line. We've run out of racetrack on this episode of Mega World Dubai. I hope you've enjoyed it. I know I have. We'll see you next time. I'm Kevin Barash. Whoa! <laughs> 
one of the world's modern, the wonders in the modern. 